So we're here to talk about uh, gears, and as kind of part of how we're going to talk about gears, we're also going to talk a little bit about HTML5. Uh, and so we're going to kind of see a little bit of what you can do now and also the future of uh, what we're going to be able to do, um, kind of extending the web and doing really cool stuff in the browser. So I'm one of the last things that kind of comes between you guys and beer, so I'll try not to go too long. Uh, and we'll get to the, the wrap-up that I think is going to be pretty exciting as well. So for those that uh, weren't in an, one of my other sessions, my name is Dion Almer. Uh, I work on a site called Ajaxian, which is all about doing Ajax news and all of the cool, fun stuff that the community is coming up with to kind of do uh, cool new things. And I obviously work at Google. Uh, part of my role is I run an open web group uh, and part of the open web group, we have technology like Gears uh, kind of behind it. So our role is just kind of to push the web forward. And that's why you've heard a lot of that today and from uh, other events that we've had recently, how we're really trying to kind of uh, push that forward. And now we have a group to try and actually back that up, which is uh, pretty fun to be a part of. So we're in pretty interesting times uh, on the web as well as the politics uh, back in, uh, I'm, I'm from England, but I live in the States, and so I get to be there for lovely elections like we're having right now uh, that seem to go for years and years. But it's, uh, it's pretty interesting times in the, the politics of the web and what we're actually able to do. And I talked uh, this morning at the state of Ajax how it kind of feels like we're coming out of this dark winter uh, with the browser, and the browser vendors are kicking in, and uh, you know, Gears has really been uh, one thing that's trying to kind of push forward uh, despite the browser vendors themselves. So we've got these interesting things coming in, and there's certain beliefs that we have uh, at Google and that I have uh, around the open web. Does anyone know what this guy is? A few people know about the flying spaghetti monster. That's good. Uh, that's a real, that's a true religion. Um, so definitely worth checking out. I'll be an evangelist for the spaghetti monster. So as Chris said at the keynote, we believe that the web is the platform of today and of the future. Google grew up on the web. It couldn't be here without it. And so we're doubling down on the web as a platform, not some Google platform that can then try and lock people in. Uh, our goal is to try and keep it open because that makes Google successful. The minute something comes around and closes it up, uh, we're in trouble. That could be content that we can't spider and then add to our search engine, all that kind of stuff. So it's totally in our interests uh, to keep it open. It's not just you know, some grandiose thing that we want to help out. Developing on the web is hard. I feel this guy's pain, and I like how the guy uh, uh, who did this, Alan Foreman, uh, calls himself Alan, quote, IE users must die, Foreman. That's kind of an interesting uh, choice of a given middle name. But, you know, we really feel this pain at Google, too, as we develop apps. Uh, and sometimes it's even more frustrating because we have to deal with, you know, all of the browsers in the world because a tiny uh, market share for some bizarre browser out there could still be, you know, a lot of people accessing Google. So I really feel for the people on Google search that have to make this work across you know, a myriad of devices and browsers and all that kind of fun stuff, but we, we understand this pain. And uh, as a community, I think it's time for developers to kind of step up and take ownership of this platform and start to kind of push this forward. Um, I'm constantly very frustrated with getting stuff to work uh, in different ways. In this talk, we're going to kind of go through three different stages. We're going to look at the past of uh, what happened when Gears came out, how it came, came, came to be, we're then going to look at the present on what's available today that you can build apps for, and then we're going to take a little glimpse at the end of the future so you can kind of be aware of uh, where things are going, both uh, from Gears and, and uh, in other places. But of course, this past is from you know the 1970s or something. Our past uh, for Gears is more like two years ago when this uh, goofy YouTube video got popular. And so by past, we're actually talking about a very, very recent uh, development for us. So this is what happened. We get a ton of feature requests for different things on our products, and the number one feature request for some of the products uh, was being able to have stuff work offline. And so we launched this Google Reader, 
uh, going offline. It's still just over a year ago, um, so it, it's very new. And it enabled people to go there, click, say they're going offline, take their browser offline, as we're going to do here, and then still continue to go and look through the feed. So it's you know, obviously a very simple system for us to be on a plane or what have you and still have access to your feed. So this came from a feature request, uh, a lot of them from users saying, we need this functionality. So we had a group that wanted to build that. Some people say, <coughs> why? Why do these people want it? How often are you really on a plane or something? These days, connectivity is growing. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And this talking head in the corner, does anyone who th know who that is? DHH, the Rails guy, he wrote a famous blog post after we were doing stuff with Gears and Adobe was doing stuff with Air and other people were doing offline stuff. And he said, I live in Chicago. I never go anywhere. I don't care about, uh, you know, I'm never offline. So, so who cares about this stuff? Uh, what you're going to see in these technologies is that Gears isn't really even about offline. Some of the early stuff that we did, sure, you can use to make your apps offline, but that's, that's not what it's really about. And even at the beginning, um, there were different scenarios that we were trying to solve. So the reliability problem, okay, if you're not offline a lot, but if it's when you're sending that important email to your tax accountant that it goes offline, then mm -hmm. it's frustrating. Whereas if you have a system that can seamlessly uh, continue to work and when you come online again, it just keeps going, uh, that's going to be great. Performance is another key feature. This stuff is to make your web apps run faster, regardless of whether or not they're online or offline. And we'll see examples of uh, people that are doing just that. And then the convenience is kind of funny how, you know, I live in Palo Alto, the heart of Silicon Valley, and there's still a bunch of places where I can't get uh, online. And in the past, I, my mental model would just be, okay, I know where I am here. I can't get online here. There's no 3G even for my card for my laptop. Um, so I kind of know not to open up the computer, whereas now for the apps I know are offline, I can continue to do so. So you're offline more than you think, but it's about a much more, uh, many more use cases than just the offline one. It also takes way too long to update the web. Again, if you look at the web developer side of Google versus like the Chrome side building browser or whatever, uh, we want to develop compelling applications for users to use our services. And it was very frustrating for about 10 years where the browser clients were not really moving. And we were kind of locked in to just a few vendors and whatever they wanted to do. Right? And so we really needed to step up and be like, we need to kind of move forward. We need to do new interesting things. So that's how we came <coughs> to develop Gears. We had an app like Google Reader. We needed to take it offline. We quickly realized how complicated it was to do that. Like, we have to make it work across all the browsers, the plugin models on some are good, some aren't. Uh, to get to some low-level situations, it's really hard. It was really, really, really difficult to do this. And as we built it, we realized that this makes no sense for anyone else, any other developer out there, if they want to take their app offline, to go and do this themselves. It doesn't make sense to have yet another plugin, and it's just complicated, ugly, C hacking that, you know, a lot of web developers just aren't going to find interesting, and it's not going to be worth their time uh, to get offline functionality. So we realized we needed to just get this out there and give that functionality uh, to developers as a whole, and then hopefully build a community where people can then add new components and features and things to it. And so again, giving developers this control versus uh, kind of living with what the browsers gave us. So we solved it in general, and then to make sure that people didn't think we were trying to do this platform play, that it wasn't like, oh, we'll give you gears and then uh, suddenly we're going to start selling tools around it and doing all these things, we made it as liberal as we could with a BSD license to kind of say, hey, this is why we're doing it. We just want to make the web better. We want people doing stuff, uh, nothing more, no platform goals behind this. So for this to work, we uh, have to have browsers, obviously, that supported it. At the moment, we've got uh, a whole slew of these. Opera is the only one that uh, we don't have support with right now, but uh, apparently they're, they're working on that too. We recently announced uh, Safari support, and Chrome has it built in. For the other ones, it's a, a plugin that comes into the system. So obviously, it has to support the browsers, and it also has to support you know, the different operating systems, including mobile. And one of the key things about Gears for Mobile is that all of the APIs work exactly the same, whether it's on the mobile phone or the desktop version. 
So there's no gears light where these things work over there and not uh, elsewhere. Everything that we go through today works exactly the same way uh, across the mobile phone and the rest. And Gears for Mobile is actually really exciting to me because that's where there are all of these latency issues and you know, problems that, that we foresee. And uh, it actually could be a, a really good way to add functionality to the phone system. So we'll see what happens there. The philosophy behind Gears was not to build this like whole new system. So people often say, you know, is this like Adobe Air? And it's actually very different. Adobe Air is great for its purpose, and ours is great for our purpose. So AI is all about giving developers that know web stuff the ability to build desktop applications. Right? So you go, you build an executable, and it runs, and it does its thing, and you happen to use Flash or Ajax. Uh, Gears is all about add, adding functionality to the browser itself. So one of the core philosophies were to have the same application is just a URL. You go to google.com slash reader, and if you're online or you're offline, it works. And the good news is that it just continues to work and things are happy. The bad news is that uh, you notice certain users um, find that a little bit um, not what they're used to. If you're in an offline situation, it seems weird at first to open a browser and type in a URL. Uh, it's kind of, well, I'm, I'm offline, that's not going to work. Uh, but of course, in our case, that, that's definitely the whole plan. But it's one URL is an application. You don't go to uh, reader and then download the offline application, per se, um, although we'll see how that's changed a little bit, too. The other notion is this notion of transitions. Uh, so some of the apps have uh, implicit and some have explicit transitions. When Reader came out, and still today, you explicitly say, I'm going offline now, and it then syncs everything down. Um, that's definitely an issue, because sometimes you don't know you're going to go offline. So there's different architectures where it can constantly be syncing. Uh, and we'll take a look at a little example there, too. But you have to think about UI-wise, how are you going to let the user know if they're online or offline? Does it matter uh, in your application? And just kind of take care of that. We definitely want Gears to be useful when you are connected. So it's not a solution for on the desktop when you're offline. It's a solution to do all these other things, performance and geolocation and all this other stuff that makes your web apps better when they're online. And as a side effect, you can also build applications that work when you're offline, too. So it's not just about offline is the message here. Another thing we've done is rather than having this big you know, platform of APIs and huge things that all kind of tie in together, the philosophy was more to kind of copy what happened with Ajax. And with Ajax, that little XHR object that is very low level, uh, you know, very strange API, you need to know numbers, the state's four, then that means that things are OK, and all that kind of crazy stuff. Uh, it didn't matter because people built on top of that. So we saw this whole slew of libraries, uh, the Ajax libraries, prototype, et cetera, jQuery Dojo, blah, 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 on top of it. But what was interesting was that low-level component was enough for these developers to then kind of run with it and do amazing new things in their web apps. We want to do the same thing. You'll see all these little APIs are very, very small, tight, low APIs that you can use. And then there's a whole bunch of libraries, such as Dojo Offline and GWT has support that go on top of this that can uh, add different features on top of it as well. So it's very much little APIs that you can use. So when we shipped, these were the three APIs that we had. Uh, we had a local server, which was a way to cache uh, information for when you're offline. We had a database, which was all about just how to store stuff in a rich SQL database uh, so you could have access to it in your app. And we had worker pools, which are all about giving you threading-like behaviors without using traditional threads uh, to get more uh, responsive applications. So we'll take a, a peek at, at these different pieces. So this is the database API. The database is just a pure SQLite uh, database that's running within the browser. And we'll see within there, at the beginning, there's the Google Gears Factory Create. That's the way you always get access to a Gears API. It's always the same. There's just a different string that denotes what API you want. So here, we want the database API version 1. And so we grab access to that API in the variable DB. We then can open one. Uh, so we open a database that is scoped to your particular application, which is scoped to a URL. So if I build an application that does an open database demo and you build one, there's no collision there. It's all sandboxed uh, for a particular URL. 
and that's obviously a, a security issue. Then if you look at the executes and the, the while loops with the result sets, that should ju look just like the language that you're used to doing this database SQL stuff, you know, PHP MySQL or what have you, JDBC, ODBC. Uh, it's just a very low level SQL API that, that you can use to access the database. Like I said, on top of that, people started to abstract and uh, give different functionality. This is a library called GizDB that's actually my library that gets away from SQL and just gives you the ability to work with JSON objects. So you'll see up here, I create a person called Bob and he has some uh, features, a name and a URL and a description. I can then just insert that into the database and it takes care of it for me. I can then go ahead and select things and I can optionally give a real SQL to do selects and then it's gonna asynchronously give me people back. And then I can do updates by just changing the object and forcing it back uh, into the system. So a nice, very little shim that sits on top of the database API to give you the ability to just work with uh, JSON objects and store them and retrieve them. Then people started to get even more crazy and they were building these ORM systems. So a lot of Java guys that like Hibernate started to jump on this and saw, oh, I can start doing a Hibernate-like solution. This is one, Gears ORM. There's others, there's one called Juice, J-O-O-S-E. And in general, you build a model out of your JavaScript objects and then you can go ahead and just do saves and selects and things like that, and it takes care of the mapping for you. So there's a full object relational mapping system, uh, but you need to have a really big app for that to be worthwhile. We don't see too many people uh, going that, that far abstract. This is a cool one. There's someone created this, it's called GearShift, and the problem is, is that now you've got these local databases on your users' machines, how are you gonna upgrade them if you change something in your app? Right? The beauty of having something in the cloud is you make the change once in the cloud, you change your code in the cloud, and you're done. Here you've got version one of these databases across uh, all of the different people. So the GearShift guys were Rails developers, and if you've seen Rails has migrations built in, and the way it works is you're at a version, and you say go up to version four, and say you're on version one, it's gonna go through and say, do what I need to get to two, do I need to get to three, and then do what I need to get to four. And then you can say, go back to version two, there was a bug, and it will say, go down to three and down to two. And so that's been implemented in JavaScript, so you can do the same thing to manage your uh, local SQL databases if you want. So there's a bunch of tools being built around that SQL database. There are tools uh, that are allowed to uh, <coughs> allow you to just talk to your database when you're doing development. So this is just a, a simple one, we'll take a look at uh, another one that's built into the SDK. This one though is kind of interesting. It's, it's a way of building up your model just uh, through the tool itself. So rather than kind of writing SQL to create tables and do all of that kind of stuff, we can go ahead here and take a look at the database and see that we've got some rugby going on and uh, this is the relationship. It's a has many relationship. We can go through and make life changes to the data and so we could build out our entire uh, data, data model without even uh, touching any SQL uh, whatsoever. And it's got different smart things to understand when it sees a URL to show the actual uh, image for the URL and things like that. So there's lots of modeling tools that you can use. And because this is just SQLite, you can use a uh, local SQL uh, manager program on your machine. So there's you know, different SQL managers out there uh, for different operating systems. You could just use that uh, to look at your database too while you're doing development. So there's a bunch of tools out there. Now, this is a case study. We'll see a, a couple of different examples for the different APIs. This is a company called Buxfa. They're two guys in a garage in uh, Palo Alto in California, and they're part of the Y Combinator startup group. And what they do is kind of personal finance aimed at kind of like college students or young professionals that share things. So you like share an apartment with a buddy. And so who paid this bill, who paid that bill to kind of like manage that. So you can just at the end of the month say, well, we kind of evened out, just give me 10 bucks or whatever. And one thing they got was that this talks to the bank system and their users were like, you're two guys in a garage in Palo Alto. How can I trust you with my uh, bank information? And one route they could take would be they could say, 
oh, hey, we're totally secure and we're great and blah, 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 and trying to argue that they're this great secure system, but uh, they took a different tact, which was to say, uh, I kind of understand that, and so we're gonna give you an option, which is uh, to use Gears and store your information just locally on your machine. And then when we do transactions, you pass up these credentials and we do stuff and we never store it. And so certain people then uh, would trust that more, even though we could argue whether that's uh, any more secure and everything else. But it was just kind of interesting to see. It doesn't work offline or anything like that. They just use the local database uh, to store information uh, in their particular web app. Now, we're Google, we like to do searches. <coughs> so we added the search ability to SQLite. And so this now is not only in Gears, it's in any, anything that's out there that's got a, a new SQLite, you can use it. We've added an index mechanism, so you can create a virtual table like this guy. And so we've got a virtual table with a particular recipe, and this is this full text search system. And it's then gonna index anything that's in that table. And it's gonna be like a reverse index like is used on Google. So you'd start to do a search, and it's gonna search the index versus going to the uh, database itself. And so we can then go through and do these really, really super fast reverse index searches uh, on our data. And so you can access that just through SQL also. Here's an example of that. This is an app called the Dig Oracle by a guy called Brian Shaler. And the way this works is you put in a username and it's gonna go out to dig and it's gonna download all of my dig information. So anything I posted, anything I liked and dug, it's gonna go out there and it's gonna download that all for me. And once it does that, it's gonna put it into one of those indexed uh, databases and I'm gonna start querying it and notice how fast it is uh, to get results uh, because that's going over that, that index solution. So this is pretty cool. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> we've seen this in a couple of other use cases where you've got, say, an app where you've got sales guys on the road and they have connections that go in and out. They can, in the morning, go online, download a whole bunch of data, run reports on it, do queries on it, uh, even when they're offline. And so we've seen people kind of using it in that way. This is MySpace, as you can see from its beauty. I can't talk. Google's got a white page and but they added search uh, fairly recently to their messaging. So I didn't even know this, but if you had a MySpace uh, message account and you wanted to go back and find that message that was sent to you three months ago, you had to paginate all the way back to it. There's no way to search for that message or anything. There's no way to, to get access. And that seemed kind of weird and asked them why. And the reason is that you know, they're scaling like crazy and they have to match that scale and to do that search stuff was too CPU intensive. They didn't think that they had enough machines to actually pull it off. So they never added that feature even though it was one of the highest uh, requested features for their message system. So what happened is one of their uh, engineers just for fun started playing around with gears and he had it so when you go onto your MySpace messages it would download them and you can search them. And in fact, as you type, it was doing real time sorting. So the more you type, the more it gets filtered down. And so they kind of then showed that uh, to their bosses at MySpace and they suddenly realized, oh wait, uh, we can actually push out search because we're gonna use all of the users' machines to do it and we're not gonna have to use any machines in the cloud at all. And so they pushed that out and they continued to kind of push it out uh, more and more. And that was just kind of a, an interesting one for us to see this use case that we never really thought of, which is if you're running out of CPU stuff and you're not using App Engine to just grow it automatically, then you can just use the, the user's machine to start filtering and doing interesting things on the data. So they put search out there, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. So that's the database. That was kind of the first component. Rich SQL database now in your browser. Local server is the next piece. Okay, you've got all this rich data, but what happens when I go offline? Uh, with local server, you can think of it as a running little web server in, in your browser that's intercepting uh, these requests for this application, and all that browser can do is return a 200 message saying everything's okay with the data, or a 304 HTTP code. What does 304 mean? Nothing modified. All right, so just use whatever you've got there, nothing has changed. So this is kind of like an advanced cache. 
that can just sit there and intercepts things uh, when the browser starts trying to talk to the network. So if you're offline, it can return data back. So there's two APIs <coughs> that you can use. At first is a thing called a resource store. And uh, just like uh, before, I use the same way of getting access to it uh, from the factory. We get a local server. And from there, we can go ahead and open a new store, open a new cache, or create one if it doesn't exist. And then manually, you go through and you say, I want to capture that file. So here, I'm going through and capturing uh, an array of files, which are like the JavaScript, the HTML, and the actual app. This is where you put images, CSS, anything else, anything you want to be there if you're offline. And it's going to go through in the background and just download the stuff. Uh, and then you have a callback to get information about it. And now, if you go to this page again, or any of those pages captured, they're going to instantly come out out of this cache. It's not going to go through to the backend server itself. So that's the programmatic way to start aggressively caching things with local server. There's a problem with this. The problem is that, say you got version 1 of your app, and you want to go to version 2. And you have a bit of script that goes and does that capture. And halfway uh, while it's doing that, something goes wrong. The internet goes down or what have you. Now that local cache has half of the files as version 1 and half as version 2, and the entire application could be totally broken. So that's why we uh, put in manage resource store. This guy is just a JSON definition that uh, has a bunch of metadata, but then most importantly, gives you a way to put in your entries, which are the different things that your app is going to need, and that's version with a particular version. If we change this and make a change here, then the browser is going to go through and it's going to download version 2. Only when it's downloaded everything OK is it going to then kind of swap that into the resource store. So it's a way to make sure that you version your application. There's a few other little features in here, like an aliasing mechanism. So if you go to main.html, it's going to grab a different file actually behind the scenes. This is if your offline app is so different than the main one that you have a totally different page that kind of handles it when you're in offline mode. And most of the time, we, we try not to do that. And then there's a few different things about redirections and stuff. But that's the way you kind of say, these are all the things I want uh, when I'm offline. It's pretty easy. WordPress <coughs> started to use Gears. They wanted to take the admin side of WordPress and make it so you could blog offline. So you know, again, you're on this plane. You want to write a blog. You can do it, queue it up. And then when you land and get online, it would then uh, send the message up there. Uh, the first thing they did, though, was that they used that local server, and someone realized that the whole app was running a lot faster for them. And that was because every time they were trying to do something, it was getting it from this cache. And it's much more aggressive than any kind of caching that you can often do because it's very easily defined. This is the version. These are all the files. Make sure they're always there. Don't delete them over time if you're running out of space and all that kind of stuff and the different magic that browsers have within their caches. So WordPress now has a little feature where uh, it says speed up in the top right corner. And when you click on that, it downloads the entire app uh, to your cache. Because you know when there's a new version, it's just going to version this stuff up. So it only downloads it once, uh, and then you're done for all of the WordPress stuff. So again, using it not just for offline, uh, but just to speed up the actual application. <coughs> so. Let's take a look at a little app, just to kind of put it together a little bit. We're going to do a uh, to-do list system. And we're going to go in here, and we're going to start uh, entering tasks. So uh, go to Oktoberfest, drink a few beers, maybe. And we're going to have this system. And then, because this all works <coughs> offline using the database, I can actually go through, and there's this DB query HTML that comes with the SDK with gears that you can just drop in. And then you can just start executing queries. So here I can kind of see what's going on. I can then say, oh, OK, there's a tasks table. So I'm going to grab everything from it. Um, oops. That's better. Grab what's going on inside there. And then I can go. You know, offline and still get access to uh, everything I'm working on, etc. And so to take a peek at this uh, little sample app code, 
to see how kind of simple it is. We've got the web page itself, which is just going to go through and grab access to the gears init. This is the thing that makes sure that gears is installed. And then this app happens to split out a common set of JavaScript and then uh, the backend service itself, because there's actually multiple versions. This is an open source uh, little sample. Here we've got a form that saves the task when you put it in. That's the input. And then you've got a list of tasks that are going to be populated uh, when you're done. So now if we look at the common stuff uh, itself, well, let's look at the uh, service itself first. Here's on load. When we're on load, go ahead and make sure the database is set up correctly, and then go ahead and grab the tasks. So if we look at setup database, this is just like we saw before. Go ahead, create access to the database API, create the table if it doesn't already exist. You can see there's other helpers in here to make sure you clear things, clear the database. This is what you end up doing for debugging because you want to kind of play around with things and see what's going on. And then here we just have a way to go back and download tasks from the server and display them uh, into that task list div. Okay, back to the server. So again, it said set it up and then get the tasks. This guy over here uh, is going to go ahead and do that. And the architecture that it's using is go and get the local ones first. So immediately go to the database that's local, grab anything you can and display them. Then go online if you can and try and download a new set of tasks. Right? So first we have the local tasks, which is just a select from the database. And then we have um, the download tasks, which we saw back here, which goes out, tries to grab it from the server, and then uh, displays and updates into the database. So this architecture choice is always do local first and then try and talk later on. Right? And so this is where there's different architecture decisions based on how you want to deal with concurrency and syncing and all that kind of stuff. This is a very simple one that's just local, if not, go ahead, and then you don't have to worry about doing checks for if the user is offline or not. Uh, it's just going to work. Okay. So we talked about the local server to cache stuff, the database <coughs> to store stuff. Um, Chris in his keynote talked about the issue of UI responsiveness, where a user is clicking and doing different things, typing in uh, commands to the browser, and the browser has a fight on its hand between running JavaScript that is your code on one side and doing actual web browsing on the other, and we get this bottleneck where everything is freezing up. And so we saw this problem as we were building these richer apps like Google Reader offline where we were running into this a lot. The UI was hanging and freezing all the time, and it actually came out to be a lot of the time that uh, the database was the issue. So that SQLite database, whenever we were doing a big insert, say, everything was locked while it was doing the insert into that database because the browser main UI thread was doing that insert. And so that's the actual reason why uh, we came about and implemented these worker pools. So with worker pools, what we do is we don't do an insert in the thread. We send a message to this guy and say, hey, go ahead and do an insert into the database, and it does it somewhere totally different. It's in another process that handles that for us, and then it'll maybe come back and say, okay, I inserted five of them, or whatever you need, maybe you don't care. And then you could run something else in a worker pool over here and start doing some work in that process. But they're not joined, uh, we just are sending these simple messages that are strings or now JSON objects, and that's it. There's no window object, there's no access to the document model, and so we have this total separation of church and state uh, between the code that you're going to run in there and the browser. And we're going to see that uh, comes in handy for security. But to give an example for the people that weren't in my talk earlier, this is a prime number calculation. And this is running it from the browser itself. And the light that's going backwards and forwards there that looks like Knight Rider's kit is showing how responsive the UI is. Right? So in the real world, this is what the user is feeling. You see how it's getting choppier and choppier as it takes more time to do a calculation for that prime number. Right? And so the more stuff we're doing in JavaScript, the worse the browser's doing, and we get really, really frustrated as a user. 
If I stop that and kick it off over here in a worker pool, now I've got these processes living elsewhere that are doing the calculation, and all I'm doing is passing back a message saying, here's the new prime. And it says, oh, go do another one. Here's a, here it is, go do another one. And so it's just these small little messages going back and forth, and the real CPU intensive stuff is done out of the browser. And that's why for the user, they see a nice responsiveness uh, as this guy goes backwards and forwards. So this is why we did it, to make sure that the browser was always responsive, uh, even in these offline applications uh, that we're using the database. And we thought, hey, this is genu genuinely useful for developers, so let's make it its own component instead of just solving it for that one uh, database problem. So here's how it works. Here's the trim down code. <coughs> At the very top, we have the code that calculates the prime number, minus the actual crazy algorithm to work it out, which is fairly simple and it's in the sample. And we calculate that, and then we're gonna send a message back uh, to the worker pool that we'll see in a second. Over here, this is where we create access to the API, just as usual with the factory, and then we have a callback that says, when a message gets sent to this pool, go ahead and do something. In this case, we're just doing an alert to say here's the prime number. In the example itself, it would move the guy and it would update the messages saying that you know, something's happening with the prime number. And so at the bottom here, we actually create a worker and we say create a worker on this pool and this is the JavaScript I want you to run. And that JavaScript is literally compile the function and then run the function in this case. And so it's gonna run, it's gonna work it out, and it's gonna then pass back a message, which is then gonna call this on message, and so that's how you communicate between the two. All right, so it's a fairly simple, small API where you write some code and you say, run this code, and then it has a way to talk back to you to give you a message back. All right, so it's, it's pretty trivial. Now, because of the fact that that code that's running over there doesn't have access to uh, any of the browser internal stuff like you normally do in JavaScript, uh, Doug Crockford from Yahoo uh, gave a talk about how this could solve the problem with mashups with respect to security. Because now you could write some code, say on a external site, and you could say uh, untrusted guy or trusted guy, go ahead and run this code within the context and the guy that's got the service can't say, okay, give me your cookies and I'm gonna send them back to me. And so that's what we did with the next version of Gears, we added a very easy way to do that where instead of doing create worker that we saw here, there's a create worker from URL and you give it the URL to a JavaScript file. And within that, it's gonna have the actual API that it can run to do its work. And there's whitelisting and blacklisting to be able to say your particular service can only be run by this one other site or anyone or what have you. And so we're building this in to be able to do this cross domain mashups uh, in an interesting way. So you can talk to services and get them to do things, but only what that service is allowed to do and have it trusted from both sides. So you know, mashups are a huge thing. We've seen all of the maps mashups and doing all this cool stuff, but what about the next level and having read write mashups so I can have something that talks to my bank and adds money to it. We'll be able to do that kind of stuff uh, through Gears um, and some other interesting things too. Okay, that was the offline years. That was the initial release a year and a half ago, and that was it. It was just those three APIs, and that's why it kind of made it look uh, a little bit offline heavy. Now we're gonna kind of shift forward into the present and see all of the cool new things that uh, we recently put out there. So this is uh, from August 22nd, we released a new version of Gears called 0.4. Uh, we like to do really low version numbers so people are scared uh, about what it actually is. And we're gonna take a look at all of the APIs, some of which are mentioned here, geolocation and stuff, uh, that you now have access to through Gears. So this is the geolocation API, and this is a little app uh, that I wrote that just plots it on a map where you are. And this API uh, will go through and it'll try and find out, obviously, where you're actually physically located, both desktop and mobile phones. So mobile phones probably more likely have a GPS uh, device that it can talk to, but if it doesn't, or even on the desktop machine, it's gonna go through a list of providers. So the most accurate thing is GPS, but then there's also which IP address, 
uh, you're having to, which can be crazily off target. Um, and then there's cell tower IDs and things like that. So it's gonna try different methods to work out where you are, and the API is gonna tell you how accurate it is. So it's gonna say, yeah, this is an IP address, so you know, beware, this is very uh, inaccurate. Or this is a GPS device, so this is very accurate. This is how the Gears API works. Again, it's pretty small. You get access to the geolocation. You can then just say, give me the current position and pass in two callbacks, one for success and one for failure. So in this case, it's gonna go through and just send an alert of where the person actually is, they're lad and long, and then if there's an error, it's gonna tell them there's an error. This is a one-time, give me their location now. There's also a watch position that's down here. That's gonna, whenever your location changes, it's gonna call back to you so you can do it. So you could do driving directions and all the time as you move, it's gonna call back to your app and you can then update uh, where the person is as they're moving around. So that's a geolocation API as it is with Gears uh, itself. Now, if we take a look at this example, we actually launched another thing somewhat confusingly with that. So here's this app uh, and what's going on. <coughs> Let's open this up. So this is the first one uh, that we did. And this guy actually shows something slightly different, which is a client location module, which also gives you the geolocation, but just based on IP address. So this is kind of like a fallback. If they don't have gears installed, you can always just use this and it's even simpler in API if once you get access to the API by including it in JavaScript, you then have access to this object if it exists and it found something, and then you can go ahead and ask it for the different address information. So this works regardless of a plugin, it just always works as long as we can do a reverse geocode uh, for that location. So that's fine. This version though, uses the, uh, the Gears guy, but even more, I wrote a little wrapper that would allow you to use the standard API. So within here, there's something even different, navigator.geolocation. This is part of the W3C standard for doing geolocation stuff. And it's almost the same as Gears. And that's because the guy who wrote the Gears version is actually the author of the spec. So that's why it's gonna look very similar. But there's a few subtle differences uh, within here, but this is me using the actual W3C version of, of the spec itself, and I wrote a little bit of shim code up here, this geo meta, that takes care of it for you. So you can write to the future standard that no one supports yet, and it's gonna use gears if you have it installed, or it's gonna use that client location uh, if it's available. But you, as the programmer, can just write to the standard today, uh, even though it's not gonna be available in a browser for uh, some time period, who knows when. So there's a bunch of geolocation stuff going on. The desktop API, this is a trivially simple API. This is just uh, what Chrome actually uses, Google Chrome. When you go through, you may have noticed uh, there's a way to make an application. You go through and say, you're on Gmail, go ahead and make an app. It's gonna then download a shortcut uh, to your desktop that you can then click on and it opens up Gmail in its own browser. That's actually part of Gears that's doing that. And it's cross-browser, of course, with Gears itself. So you go ahead and get access to it, and you say, I want a desktop shortcut with this different meta information, the name of the shortcut, uh, the icons to use, and where you want it to open, and it's gonna take care of that. So you can add that as an option uh, to your application. File upload, this was brought up uh, again at the keynote, and this is something I've been wanting for a long time a better way to do file upload stuff. Like it's amazing that in Gmail, if I wanna attach three files, I have to browse, select one, say give me another file upload, I mean it's crazy. Uh, and so we're finally trying to do something about it. Uh, as Chris said, if you go to YouTube, it's gonna ask you if you wanna use the special Gears uh, multi-uploader, and that's gonna allow you to select all of the videos you want and upload them with the uh, progress bars. Let's take a look at a, uh, the APIs that it actually uses for this. Uh, this is the interesting thing about Gears, it's all small little APIs that you can piece together in interesting ways. 
So the file system API, this is a guy where you say, open up a file and it's gonna pop up uh, the file dialog for the user to select things. And then you're gonna get access to those objects. And the way you access them is that you get them as blobs. So it's just a set of binary stuff that all you can do is get streams out of it. So someone selects a file, you then have access to that binary file that you can then start doing stuff for. And we've added on to HTTP in the latest version. So there's a version of the XML HTTP requesting gears that does more stuff. One of the things that it does is it supports resuming. So if you've got 90% of the way uploaded and the connection dies, when you start again, it starts from 90%. It doesn't start from zero. So let's take a look at this example. Happens really quick. Let's see this again. We're going to select it. We're going to select multiple guys. We open it up. It now says, are you ready to upload? We start clicking that, and we're going to start seeing the different files uploading. In this case, it's serially. So this is an app that Brad Newberg wrote as a sample. It's a fully open source that you can check out that uses these APIs, and it also uses like the geolocation to you know, work out where you are, to tag them as it uploads them, and then gives you the, the video when it's finally uploaded. It uses App Engine on the back end, uh, and you can have access to it. So progress, upload, all of that stuff is available through those APIs. So let's look at the code. This is the desktop piece. So here we get access to the desktop API, and we then go ahead and say open the files, and that's gonna be where that pop-up comes, and the users select whatever they want, and then you, the programmer, are gonna get access to those files uh, via callback, which is this guy over here, and you can start doing stuff with the files. In this case, we're grabbing the blob, which is the binary data, and then under that is where it starts doing the upload. At the bottom here, we have a filter. This is for that dialog box that opens up. You can make it so it's only videos, in this case, that people can select. So if you're doing a photo uploader, you can limit it to that. So any MIME type or file extension uh, can be used to limit what's going on. So now we have an easy way to pop up a dialog multiple uh, file uploader. The HTTP side, you get access to this beta request. This is just this object that looks very similar to XHR. You can then go ahead and open a URL and you can set these uh, different headers to give you access to the different ranges to go ahead and you know, upload and continue uh, where you were from, not from the beginning again. And then finally, the progress side of it. As part of it, there's an on-progress system and if you do a post request or a put request, it's gonna do a callback here and it's gonna tell you what's going on as a progress event. And that event tells you the total number of bytes that have been uploaded uh, and what's going on and can it work out the total length and all that kind of stuff. And so you can use that to do the simple math to say it's 50% done. And so that's built into the transport itself. So you piece this all together and you get a uh, nice uploader. So that's where we are. That's the, uh, the now stuff that just came out fairly recently. We're gonna take a peek at some of the other stuff that's kind of coming. People working on a notification API. So this is an API that allow you from your web app to go ahead and start pinging little messages to the user through their notification system. So on the Mac, I use Growl, so it pops up for me in the way I want it. Windows, the little toasters, uh, whatever you have going on, but you have a simple way to just get access to the API and then do these different requests to notify people. This is something that the community is kind of playing with uh, right now, and there's definitely you know, issues where we don't want people to be able to spam you and all that kind of stuff, uh, but there's a working version that was showed at Google I.O. that was pretty cool, and so hopefully this will be coming out pretty soon. By the way, you can see all of this in the open on the open source project. So all of the engineers, uh, even the Google ones, it's all spoken about uh, on the public wiki and stuff. Another thing is audio. So if you want to play music or something like that, how do you do that today on the web? Well, you have to use some little hack, like a flash hack. Right? So you use like Sound Manager 2, this nice little flash file that you can include that you can then play music through flash. And that's great, but that's you know, a real hack. This should be built into the platform. And so Gears has a uh, audio API that allows you to not only play stuff, but also record stuff. 
So you can go through easily, just grab access to a URL and play it, but you can also use this guy to record what someone's doing and get access to uh, that recording through the blob. So again, new functionality that we're gonna be able to add to these websites so we can play obnoxious background sounds again uh, with even more control. Okay, so a whole slew of APIs. What about uh, HTML5? So as we kind of talked about before, um, there's this zipper effect happening with Gears and HTML5, which is we came along and needed to add this functionality in Reader and the other properties, the YouTube uploader. The web wasn't moving fast enough, so we had to build it, and we gave it away as open source. But in the meantime, HTML5 is going ahead and trying to standardize stuff, and so we've been trying to make this stuff a standard and get it built into browsers through that mechanism. And some of the browsers, like WebKit, is doing a great job implementing a lot of these guys. So this guy is all about standards, long term, get it in the browsers, no need for plugins. Over here, we're about innovating, giving developers new functionality as quickly as we can. And then as time goes on, we're there to implement the standard APIs when they get ratified in the W3C or the other uh, standard groups out there. So our main reason for being is to innovate and also be there if one of the browsers doesn't implement any of these standards. Right? So if someone comes along and they don't implement the multi-file uploader, that means traditionally as a user, you're screwed. You can't use it because you know there's a whole set of users that it won't support. And so Gears is there to make sure that there's a base level so developers can feel free to start adding cool new features knowing that someone is there to kind of pick up the slack. <coughs> and so we see ourselves as a bleeding edge version of this HTML5 spec uh, kind of pushing and pushing new features and then going back in to ratify them. So if you look at the standards, you'll see a lot of things that uh, look familiar to what I've talked about today. There's these things called web workers, which are the worker pool. So that cool stuff where you go ahead and run things away synchronously, Firefox 3.1 has that. The latest Firefox nightly has that already. So built in regardless of gears. The geolocation stuff, i show you the example that has the W3C version of geolocation. Database stuff, there's a spec for that. That's already in Firefox and WebKit. Uh, the local server stuff, that's already in some of the WebKit nightlies. So we're seeing all these Gears APIs getting pushed into the standards and browsers are implementing them and yeah, the standard <coughs> standards are being ratified and changed. Uh, but the end goal is that this gets into more and more uh, of the browsers out there. And we're totally excited about just getting it out in any way that we can. Uh, we don't care about the plugin itself. HTML5 in general is really excited. Uh, we've got things that are out there now like Canvas and video and audio, uh, but we have all of these other controls uh, that we've wanted for donkey's years, like being able to have new input types and being able to go through and like define footers and nav bars and all of this stuff semantically, uh, define a menu and have native uh, widgets that understand how the menus work, things like that, native drag and drop. This is a huge spec. Uh, it's going to be going for quite a long time, taking pieces away and uh, giving new functionality to developers. So this is going to be like the new revolution uh, that's going to take a long time to actually get all the way through, uh, but we're totally jazzed about it. So that's kind of the universe uh, of Gears as we see it, a whole bunch of APIs. We've got this bleeding edge version of HTML5, we've got Gears pushing it, and uh, really excited about new ways that we can do things. If there's anything you wish the web can do, you can bring it up on the Gears group and we can push forward and uh, create those new widgets as well. Now, a couple of other fun things. This is something that's kind of aside uh, from Gears. One thing that I noticed was a lot of people do the same thing. They go to prototype.js.org, they download prototype and they serve it. They do the same for all the other popular libraries. Is there anything that Google could do to make that scenario better. And that's why we started to host these popular libraries on Google themselves. So we've got this uh, access here. This is just a URL that you could put in a script source equals and point it to a versioned uh, package. In this case, the example's prototype. And you can turn it to minify it and pack it and gzip it or not for debugging, all just through these command line options. And what's interesting about this is that with enough people using it, suddenly these libraries are cached, 
right? Because server A is using this file, and if I am a new little startup and I use it too, that browser's already cached it because this big guy has done it for him. So if we can get more and more developers using this, all these libraries that we're downloading and wasting bandwidth again and again can kind of become part of the browser itself, and we can do more in those libraries and not always be so desperate to, to make them small. Now in this versioning, it's got a 1.6.0.2, but you could say uh, in there instead just 1.6. And what's gonna happen is the system is smart enough to look in a little file, find the latest one in that version and grab that. In the example just below, we're using the Google API loader. That guy's looking for that 1.6. When it does that mapping, it does a script source to the real one, so it's gonna be totally cached. If you do it yourself manually through this, this URL and change it, then it's gonna to have to keep checking every X hours just in case something has been updated. But the end result is that you can say, give me version one even, and it'll just give you the latest version of that one. Or you can be explicit and say, I want this exact version, this is what I tested against. So it's pretty cool. We're pretty excited to be able to host all of these things uh, out there. We've already seen a huge uptake of users using this kind of stuff, it's trivial to just grab a URL and put it in. As I say, automatic compression, minification, and it's not tied to Google code itself, but you, if you want, uh, can build your own Google code project, put your JavaScript up there as long as it's open source, and then you can start hosting it and uh, use Google's bandwidth instead of your own for your, for your JavaScript too. GWT, we often get asked what about GWT? There's a library called GalGwit, that may have been talked about in the GWT session, and uh, that wraps the different APIs. It's been uh, revved to a new version that'll support the 0.4 release, and uh, you, know, you write your, your Java stuff, and you have these different uh, handlers, but under the scenes, it's running those same APIs that you saw. But if you're into GWT and that's what you're using, you can stay in Java land uh, to access gears. Another little just fun thing is a thing called Gears Monkey. So who, who doesn't know what Grease Monkey is? Okay, only a few people. So Grease Monkey is something that started off for Firefox but got ported to other things where you as a user can install a script that changes the web page that you're on or the set of web pages. So I can go to Amazon and use a script that shows me the price of that book in different stores or see where if it's checked out from the library or what have you. So it's a way for you to totally personalize your experience. And so we wanted to play with making other sites offline. We were frustrated. We wanted all these other things to be made offline. So we took Grease Monkey and Gears and made this Gears Monkey system that would allow us to uh, do all of that stuff for us. Here's an example. This is Wikipedia with our little user script. And we'll see in this example, we've got a bunch of things in the cache. And as I go to a particular page, it's gonna save that away. So now if I go offline, these are the different Wikipedia pages and all the images and things associated that I have access to. So I can start storing uh, different things if I know I'm gonna go you know, offline later or what have you. And this could be made smarter to go through and kind of spider and, and get uh, interesting information out there, but this was a proof of concept that we could show Wikipedia to say, hey, you should add a, you know, offline to this stuff uh, and hopefully we'll get to see that. But it's kind of fun that to play around with that you can go to other sites and uh, access them and uh, be able to get different <coughs> offline data even if they don't know anything about Gears. Okay, thanks so much for the time. I know that was a whirlwind of all of the different APIs. Uh, again, we're totally jazzed with where HTML5 is going. We're excited that you have access to those APIs right now through Gears. If you have any questions, there's an active uh, Google group and all of the stuff that is done here is done out in the community. So you can look at the wiki and for all of the different proposed APIs, they're all up there. You can comment, you can add your own, and we can together build some cool stuff on the web. And thanks so much, and I hope we have a good time in the wrap up after this. And it's been a real pleasure to be in Munich today. Thanks a lot. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I've got a mic here if anyone wants to get it.
Okay, do you want to try and shout it out? Yeah, good question. So is there a JavaScript wrapper around the worker pool? So if Gears isn't installed, it can go ahead and just do like a set timeout or something, you know, zero and try and run it. Uh, there are a few of those out there. It's not part of Gears itself, but other people have written those wrappers as well as wrappers to go around the web worker thing that I talked about. So if it's native in the browser, use that. If not, try and use Gears. If not, try and do it uh, through a little sneaky mechanism that's not going to really help the responsiveness. Good question. Yeah, good question. So the question was, uh, you've got this local database, you've got this local store, it's on the uh, client machine, is that encrypted? Can you encrypt it? There's no built-in mechanism for that. So anything that you do, it's just like a desktop app, it's stored and it's available uh, for anyone to see. So you, people will often get, as part of the install of Gears, you can customize the message and sometimes people have said, don't use on a shared computer and blah, blah, blah. You could write encryption in your own code and encrypt it. So it's not like you can't do it, uh, but it's not like built into Gears. So people have written a crypto piece that uses worker pool to do the encryption. And a library, Dojo Offline, actually does this where you can go ahead and just put a wrapper in your SQL and say, encrypt this thing. And it'll go through and encrypt it in the database. So it's there, you're able to do it, but it's definitely not made easy and built in. Uh, that's a good point. Good question. Is the database shared across browsers? Currently is not shared. So everyone, every browser has its own uh, copy that's built, built on that tree. Yep, good question. Yeah, so is there a sandbox for the URLs? Yeah, so for a uh, particular URL, everything you do within that, the local server piece and the database, like if you do an open on a database foo, that's going to be put in its own little sandbox. There's no way to talk between the domains. And that actually becomes an issue um, <coughs> that makes things a bit tricky. If you have WW1 and WW2, they don't have access to the same thing. It's literally the full URL, uh, the full domain. So in that case, that's where you have to do this cross-domain workers, where you can use workers to get around the problem and have them do the work, but it's uh, a little bit ugly. So uh, yeah, it's so secure that it becomes a pain. That's, as always, good question. Though. Yeah, good question. So you start using this gear stuff today, and then suddenly we get ratified, ratified the uh, database API that's a standard. What's the migration path? Gears um, is never going to take away its APIs. So it's not even going to be deprecated for a very long time. It's just going to be there, and it's going to be supported. Because most of the differences are, are trivial uh, right now. So we can wrap it up even uh, in the future and have it call the real thing. So you can. Yeah, the whole reason is to be assured that you can start using Gears, and then in the future you could slowly migrate or you could leave it as the Gears code if you wanted, depending on uh, what happens. You want it to work in other browsers without the plugin and stuff. Uh, and you're going to start to see more and more of these little uh, JavaScript shims that take care of it for you as well. And I want to do that preemptively. So that's why the geolocation thing, I wrote that so you write to the standard now, and then it also works on Gears, and there's a bunch of those out there. <coughs> yeah, and that's why the geolocation thing just has a if window.geolocation or if navigator dot in that case, use the native one, else it's obviously not there, so go ahead and use gears. Um, but yeah, at some point, depending on what you're doing, you may want to switch over, but it's going to be quite some time for some of this stuff. So we, we need to support ourselves because we're using gears everywhere, so we have the same issue.
Yeah, good question. So right now we support um, Windows Mobile, which is an interesting first choice for us. And, uh, and it's in the Android SDK. And so uh, at this point, I believe it's past the time. So the announcement went out that T-Mobile is there with an Android phone, which has been leaked anyway. And so Gears is on that. Uh, so it's on Android, it's on that. And then we have a whole slew of other mobile partners that uh, are working hard to get it on there. And yet, I'm actually really excited about mobile gears. I hope it gets penetration across a bunch of these guys because it just adds more features for us to be able to build this mobile web and have access to the device. So if you look at some of the stuff on the wiki, you'll see there's obvious features like getting access to the camera, address book that makes total sense for, for mobile and also can work on the desktop. Yeah, iPhone is a tough one. Uh, there's this guy, Steve, that kind of says yay or nay. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, he doesn't listen to me. So the good news there, though, and this is why we got so excited about HTML5, was we can do a sneak around Steve and get this stuff into HTML5, and WebKit supports it. And so it gets implemented on the iPhone without him even knowing. So that's our, that's our current plan of attack. <laughs> cool. Okay, well, thanks so much, guys. There's going to be a wrap-up uh, happening in the main uh, area in a little bit where they're going to show you all of this cool Android stuff. And uh, uh, thanks again.